Ruchem Aboyim, again, thank you very much for coming. Um, welcome to our house. And um, again, we'll begin with a uh, lecture on my thoughts. This week's topic will be on the uh, topic of reward. Last week, I began my thought with a Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, chapter 1, verse, chapter, Mishnah number 3. That says, Antigonus, the leader of Soho, said, Be not as servants who serve the master for the sake of receiving reward, but, but rather be like servants who serve the master not for the sake of receiving reward. Now, a statement was basically misinterpreted by two of his students, Tzadok and Baisus, Greek names, who publicly deserted the teaching of the Torah. They used his words to form a dissident group of Jews who denied the oral Torah and the concept of the world to come and its rewards. From his words, they misconstrued that there is no reward for doing a good deed, both in this world or in the world to come, and they took on the beliefs of the Greeks. Now, when Antigonus says that one should not serve God for the reward that he may receive, he's not stating that there's no reward or no compensation for doing a good deed. <clears throat> Excuse me, he's only suggesting to us that there is a better way, a better way to serve God, one that brings more reward and more pleasure to a person and also to his Creator. He's alluding to the concept that we call eker and tuffle, primary and secondary. So what is, mo what is the motivating factor in one's service of God? You or God? Who's primary? So what exactly is Antigonus telling us? So first he uses the term slave or servant, someone who's expected to serve willingly or begrudgingly, but his service is mandatory, he has no choice. The mission does not say anything about any difference in compensation, whether one's focus is on just serving the master or just receiving reward. <clears throat> so if the mission is counseling us on how to receive more compensation for our service, it should have been stated clearly. So what is being taught here is not reward, but the satisfaction of being selfless, being more of a giver and less of a taker. You know, the town in the Mishnah uses the Hebrew word pras, which means reward, instead of the more common term of schar. The question is, why the change? Now, the word pras is used when telling us the law. It's a measurement of time. For example, how much bread must be eaten within a certain time frame to fulfill the mitzvah of eating bread at a meal, <clears throat> and then being able to say the grace after meal, birchat mazon. The term is used then is achilat pras, which translates to mean the time that it takes to eat a half a loaf of bread. So the word pras is associated with the concept of half of something, not the whole. So when the Tana uses the word pras, it, is, it was to indicate to us that the reward that we get in this world is at best only half of what we have actually earned. The rest is set aside for us as a reward in the world to come. Now, the Talmud of Kedushin 39b states Rabbi Yaakov said that there is no reward for a mitzvah in this world, that all the reward is saved for a person in the world to come. How we understand this statement? We do see people that seem to prosper very well in this world. <clears throat> not only that, many of them are not righteous. So in order to understand if there is reward or not in this world, what we must do is first differentiate between those individuals that are righteous and those individuals that are not. This world is referred to as a world of sheker, falsehood. The world to come is referred to as the word of emet, truth. God is very exacting with his creations, and therefore, when anyone, whether they are righteous or not, do a good deed, they must be rewarded. However, there's a vast difference between the reward of a righteous person and the reward of one who may be evil. An evil person sees this world of sheker, of falsehood, as his emet, as his truth. And so when God rewards him for any righteous act that he had done, he can only be paid in this world that he holds as true. Whereas the righteous person cannot be rewarded in this world, since he sees this world as sheker, as falsehood. He can only be rewarded in the world to come, the world of truth. You know, in our morning prayers, we say 
every morning. There's a prayer that is taken from the Talmud in Shabbos 127b. It states, These are the precepts, the fruits of which man enjoys in this world, while the principal reward remains in the world to come. And then it lists certain mitzvot, such as honoring one's parents, performing deeds of kindness, <clears throat> early attendance in the house of study, morning and evening, hospitality to strangers, visiting the sick, and others. So from this statement in the Talmud, we see that there is some reward in this world, some, just not all. We are, so to speak, paid only interest in this world, whereas the principle is set aside for us in the next world, in our 401k, our spiritual retirement account. We know that nothing in this world is an accident. It just so happens that the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet is an aleph, numerical value of one. The last letter in the Hebrew alphabet is a tuf, which has a numerical value of 400. One plus 400, 401. And then the letter K, which of course alludes to kosher. Whether we make it a primary priority or not, God is setting aside our final and complete reward in our special individual 401 retirement account. Our Aleph to Tuff, our A to Z, so to speak, spiritual retirement account. <clears throat> now there are certain benefits that God gives a person when they follow the laws of the Torah. However, in reality, there's real no, there is really no compensation that would, one could receive in this world that would be equal to the worth of a mitzvah that one has performed. So, when we do a mitzvah, all that God can give us as a reward is the ability, the chance to do another mitzvah. As Ben Azai states in Pirkei Avot 4.2, Schar mitzvah mitzvah. The reward of a mitzvah is the ability to do another mitzvah. Another, another reward that God gives us in this world <clears throat> is based on the concept of what we call Hidur mitzvah, beautifying a commandment. For example, buying a beautiful Sefer Torah, a special pair of tefillin or mezuzot, a nicer talit, an ornate sukkah, or a perfect lulam and esri. Whatever extra beautification one can afford to purchase. Now the Talmud and Baba Kama, 9a and b state, that one can spend up to one-third more on this concept of hidur mitzvah, and that that act brings with it special reward that is reimbursed with interest in this world. The same is said about the extra expenses that we incur on behalf of our observance of the Shabbat or the Yom Tovim. Those expenditures are not deducted from our royal stipend that God has decreed that we receive that year on the high holiday of Rosh Hashanah. Another act that brings a person reward in this world is the joy that one feels when he does the mitzvah. So in reality, is a double reward. One, for performing the act which God stores in his retirement account in heaven. And then a second reward that God bestows on him in this world for the joy he exhibited while following God's commandment. That reward is immediate and automatic. In a sense, goodness is its own reward. As it says in the Psalm 100, you do Hashem b'simcha, serve God with joy. Now in addition, the road that leads us to sin is an easy one with no obstacles. Of course, <laughs> at the end of the road, it takes us right off a cliff. But the road to goodness is covered with obstacles. The sight of evil takes its job very seriously. You know, there's a saying that says, if you're on a road and there are no obstacles, then you can be sure you're on the wrong road. Again, as it says in Pirkei Avot 521, Ben Hehe said, Lefitzara Agra, according to the difficulty, is the reward meaning a seemingly easy mitzvah, done with great enthusiasm and effort, can have a much more greater reward than a seemingly difficult mitzvah, done either begrudgingly or out of rote. You know, sorry, but you can't fool God. He knows your every thought. But so does the devil. See, the devil is your subconscious. He knows you better than you know yourself. Life can be a struggle. And guess what? It was meant to be. But there is an easy solution. Connect to God and his Torah. Then somehow, 
The rest just seems to work out better. God gives you time, time for you to become you. And you need to give him time to work out all his miracles on your behalf. See, the problem is we want everything instantly. Instantly is usually the domain of the side of evil. Just push. P-U-S-H stands for pray until something happens. Stay the course. In Pirkeovos chapter 4, 17, it states, Kesar Shem Tov, Ola al Gabea. The crown of a good name surpasses all of them. The fulfillment of God's mitzvah can elevate us in the eyes of our peers. But that is intended to be the result, not the purpose of our service and acquisition of Torah knowledge. There is an allusion to this fact <clears throat> in that the, the numerical value, the gematria of the word pras, is 340, which is equivalent to the that word shame, a good name. Now, when it comes to negative commandments, we have an idea about their importance. We can do this by ascertaining the punishment that the Torah prescribes for transgressing them. Monetary compensation, lashes, death by the earthly court, an excision of the soul by the heavenly court. However, when it comes to reward for observance of positive commandments, it becomes much more difficult since there are only two mitzvot, the Torah states, as to what their reward would be. <clears throat> they are kibbut aim, honoring one's parents, and shloch hakan, sending away the mother bird from the nest before you take her eggs. Now, the Torah, the Torah tells us that the reward for observing these two commandments are identical. Arichat yomim, long life. This leaves us with a perplexing question. How can the reward be the same for these two totally different mitzvot? After all, honoring parents has to be one of the most difficult mitzvahs in the Torah. First, it's a mitzvah that spans a lifetime. When we're young, we're stupid. We say things and do things that many times are totally inappropriate. Then when we get older, many times our parents, due to age and physical or mental challenges, they become very difficult, if not impossible, to care for without transgressing the commandment. You know, there's a cute story told of a rabbi that was called to a nursing home. And an elderly gentleman told the rabbi, can you please talk to my son, Harry, you know him. He has to come see me more often. He only comes once every two weeks. It's not enough. I need to see him more often. And so the rabbi went to go see Harry. And the rabbi said, you know, Harry, your father's complaining. You don't come to see him enough. Harry looked at the rabbi and he said, Rabbi, I'm a man of 80 years old. You know, I'm just not in the good shape as I used to be. Everything hurts me. I'm going to my doctors all the time. My father, he's 103. He doesn't get it that I just can't do all these things all the time. So again, the mitzvah goes on sometimes for a very long time for those that are blessed. <clears throat> now, the mitzvah of sending away the mother bird is just the opposite. It is one that sh it's, it is a one-shot deal. It can only be observed properly when you just by accident happen upon a mother bird sitting on a nest. This cannot be a nest that you observe being made by a bird and then waited for the opportunity to take the eggs. It has to be a random encounter. There could not have been any previous knowledge or preparation. Yet, <laughs> the Torah tells us the reward for observing these two commandments is identical. How can that be? One mitzvah can take a lifetime and is fraught with difficulties and challenges, and the other is a coincidence that just happened to come across your path. What is it that God is trying to teach us? I think the answer is you cannot major in mitzvah. Do the big ones and let the, letter, let, let the lesser ones slide. Based on these two examples, one would have to wonder what exactly is a big mitzvah and what is a small one. Not only that, but all the mitzvahs are what we call Ratzon Hashem, the will of God. So whether we perceive the command to be big or small, they are a direct command from God Almighty, our King. All commands that a king issues carry the same importance and are therefore punishable by death for obedience, disobedience. There is no such thing as a small or large command given by a king. They are all one and the same. And in addition, 
The same myths are done by different people and may result in totally different rewards. A poor man who gives charity a penny, just a penny, may glean a much greater reward than a rich man who gives thousands, even millions. As I stated before, according to the difficulty is the reward. So our emphasis on serving God should not be on reward. But we need to know that in the end, every good deed that we perform, whatever our motivation, will be rewarded by God Almighty. As to how he decides what type or how much reward we deserve is not something that we can know. But the joy that we experience when we serve him properly, that is ours to decide. And then the sky is the limit. But there is one mitzvah that we do in this world that does bring a reward in this world. In fact, God hints at the fact when the Torah states in the book of Devarim in the portion of Re'eh 14.22, where it states, Aser to Aser, which translates to mean you shall surely tithe. The Talmud in Tainus 9a states that we can move the dot over the second word to the right of the sin, making it a shin, changing it to aser, meaning tithing, and changing the word to, to asher, meaning riches. So the verse is telling us, or hinting to the fact, tithe to become rich, that one can tithe and test God so that he will become rich. This is also based on a verse in Malachi, chapter 3, verse number 10. So if the reward that we receive from this would be administered in this world, it would negate our whole reason for existence. This is a world of free choice, what we call Bechira. If we would be rewarded immediately for our actions, then everyone would be good. It would counteract the purpose of the challenge of life in this world. Now, after everything is said and done, I think that we have missed the most obvious question. What is this reward that we are hoping to receive? If the reward is collected in this world, then we would understand it easily and connect it to material success, great children, good health, loving spouse, a feeling of serenity with both man and God. Well, that I can understand. But what is this great reward, great reward that, is, that we are all trying to achieve in the world to come? And the Talmud in Baruch 17.8 tells us what the reward for the righteous in the next world is, very clearly. Sadikim Yoshim Yatrosem Berushayim Benehenim Vezinah Zevach Ashchina That the righteous are sitting with crowns on their heads and they will bask in the ray of the divinity of God. <laughs> well, I said it. But what exactly did I say? I have no idea. The reason is really very logical. How can we? Think of the baby in its mother's womb. You never heard of a baby escaping the womb. Mothers wish that that is how it happens. No, the baby comes out with a great deal of help from the mother and the medical staff. But why? Why would the baby want to stay in the womb? After all, it's cramped and dark. There's absolutely nothing to do. Imagine if somehow you could shrink yourself down to the size to be a very small person and go into the womb and talk to the baby. You would let the baby know what was waiting for him when he leaves his small prison of solitary confinement. So you start out talking about the beautiful fresh air. And he says, air? Air? What's that? I live in water. Then you'll tell him, well, what about the great food that you can eat? He says, food? Eat? What's that? I'm nourished through my mother's umbilical cord. Well, well, well you'll tell him about birds and all the animals, plants, colors, the sun, moon, the stars, night and day. His head starts to spin. He has absolutely no idea what you're talking about. He has no reference to what you're talking about, color, food, air. He might as well be on another planet. Everything that is open in the womb is closed when the baby is born. Everything is different. And so too with us. Our quest for this utopia that we call the world to come. Psychologists tell us that even if you're really working our, your mind to capacity, we still are only using 20% of our brain's capacity. If that is the case, then why did God give us the other 80%? So it may well be we actually have the capacity to understand God on a much higher level. The obstacle that stands in our way is our body, our corporeality. Everything that we see, do, think, say, are all connected with our bodies and our bodily existence in some way. Take away the body, 
and the soul which resides in the brain of man can soar to untold heights. Without the limitation of a body, we will be able to see and comprehend godly wonders that are beyond anything humanly imagined. And that is why the Torah does not mention what reward in the next world is. You know, when I was younger, I would trade my younger brother pennies for dimes. His logic was simple. <clears throat> pennies are bigger than dimes. And so he was making a killing. As we know, he was using the wrong criteria. He was looking at size, not worth. And so too with us and our relationship with the reward in the spiritual world. If we will be offered it today in this world, we may well in our ignorance throw it away or just choose the penny. We do see a connection between our birth in this world and our birth in the world to come. There are many people who have had near-death experiences in their lives. They come from different backgrounds, different countries, religions, ages, but they all have one thing in common. They all say that in their journey between the two worlds, what they saw was a tunnel and a bright light. So we see that birth in this world and birth or death, as we call it, into the next world are in reality very much the same. While our physicality is in one world, it is possible for us to conceive what the next world actually is. We may hear words, but we really cannot truly comprehend their meaning. So bottom line, we talk about reward much like a little boy tells his parents that he's going to be a doctor. He has no idea what that really means or what it will entail. He has probably heard his parents talk, and these are really their words. But he believes in what they say because they are his world. So too with us. Though we do not understand what waits for us on the other side of life, we can be sure of one thing. That whatever it is that is waiting for us, it will be greater and more wondrous than anything we could possibly imagine. Because God, our Father, is waiting for us with open arms and a loving heart. How could it be anything but spectacular? And with that, may we herald in the coming of Mashiach Zikainu quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for coming. God bless and be well.